Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. This Week in Startups is brought to you by SnapTerms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code TWIST to receive a free NDA with every order. And by MailChimp. Manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups, and it's Friday, so it's time for our news roundtable. We've got an amazing roundtable. Tyler's going to read the news. Peter Rojas of Gadget is with us, and Marshall Kirkpatrick uh, is with us of Little Bird. It's going to be an amazing program. Apple Mini is out. Microsoft Surface is out. Yahoo! Marissa made her first purchase. There's a lot going on. We've got a lot to discuss. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. I'm just using my Buffer app to let everybody know we're live across like 10 different services. I love that Buffer app. Had them on the show. Really That's smart right, guys. Yeah. Hey, Tyler, how are you doing? Hey, doing good. Where you been? Where have I been? Well, I'm leaving Tuesday for Sweden again. Of course. Oh, God. <laughs> it's going to get serious. Yeah. Is, is there an announcement? <laughs> no, not yet. Special announcement? No, no special announcement yet? I have a feeling this might be it. Sorry, ladies. It might be over. Um, listen, it's uh, been an incredible run here on This Week in Startups. If you've never watched the program before, where the hell have you been? This is the 300th episode. Can you believe or 300 episodes? Yeah, if you're not involved by now, there's really yeah, little chance no for, you. for you. Yeah. But the show is blowing up. You know, yeah. we're in like the top 200 um, shows on Stitcher. Mm -hmm. We were featured on the top level of iTunes. The show is sold out through January. The show is making over half a million dollars I saw there's another new year. sponsor this week. New sponsor this week. The show is sold out, I think, like maybe through February or March now. We're, getting, we're selling out four or five months in advance. I'm hiring a full-time producer in San Francisco, and we've got a big announcement about San Francisco that's going to be coming up um, very shortly. Oh. And Jason DeMont is crushing it, working mm -hmm. with us. Um, and so really happy with the show and how it's progressing. Um, featured on the top level of and, iTunes and, was very nice, too. And at this point, I haven't heard any criticisms in quite a while. Well, aside from me being the host, no. Yes, no, right. Yeah, well. I mean, aside from criti aside from the jaders. <laughs> any no new, criticism. new criticism. Definitely. Yeah. I know, uh, no, uh, people are really getting into the show. I think we... Um, you know, the Naval, Shervin. And, you know, here's the, here's the interesting point. Naval, Shervin, Saka, like that, you know, sort of ramp up has plateaued the show. It's really interesting as an entrepreneur, you get like one or two moments where your startup, and this is a startup like anybody else is out there listening, where the startup just levels up. And we sort mm. of leveled up, I think, at the Chris Saka interview. Mm. And now the number of pitches coming in, every VC firm wants to be on the show. And it was funny, one of the top... Well, you're a damn good interviewer. Well, thank you. It's very nice of you to say. I, I kind of sucked in the first year. I look back <laughs> and look at the first year, and like, I realized when I interview people, I talk too much. Huh. And then after studying, I just made like a deliberate thing. Like, I got to be a better interviewer. Like, I'm just trying to be better at everything I do. And it's like, I got to be a better interviewer. So I watched Howard Stern. I watched Charlie Rose. I watched Oprah. And you know what they do really well? Pull they, it out. What's that? They pull it out of the guest. They can pull it out of the guest, but they, you know, it doesn't. I used to talk too much. Mm. I used to like, ask too long of questions. And you got to be able to look the person in the eye and get that trust going with mm -hmm. short questions that they're going to give you the goods. And, uh, yeah, getting them to forget that they're on camera. and Being in the moment, like being yeah. present, yeah. you know, it's like it really sort of matters. But anyway, listen, I'm really happy about the show, and thank you for all the support, and really thanks uh, to my whole team. Thank you, Tyler, for being with and us. And thanks to every – got to have to say, the coolest thing about it is when people come up in the urinal at the – Airports or, you know, whenever these things happen. Well, you know, Tyler, that was probably an overshare there. I'm going to put no, the hashtag. You know, these things happen. In the, yes, in the urinal. I, it happened to me. Somebody screamed across the street. I love the soccer interview when I was up at um, Founder Lab uh -huh. doing an interview with Jonathan Abrams, formerly of Friends. Or that, that episode hasn't come out yet. It's coming out in November. That'll be good. I yelled at me. I love the soccer interview. And I said, oh, that's very nice of you to say. Who are you? And he said, oh, I'm doing this company. So oh, that's a great idea. You know, all of a sudden we're talking. He's going to be on the program. Oh, nice. And, you know, it's just like it's become like a little community. And it is. I but really am The coolest it. thing is people don't say. Is it the urinal moment? It's no. When, when we interact with folks uh, at you the know, off the camera, off camera, sometimes at urinals, they don't say, I like the show. They say, thank you for doing the show. 
it is kind of gratifying. Like I think, and we're all that's learning. a different thing to say thank you for doing the show than to say I like the show. Yeah, it's a little bit of a higher order kind of compliment. But yeah. Anyway, you know, it's, we're all learning from the show, and you know, I, I think like I figured out what my whatever fourth or fifth act I'm going to have is. I think I just wanted like me, you, and Lon, and I, you know, I threatened this before, mm-hmm. like just do a morning show. I don't know if I could do the yeah. morning because we're also I know, late right? birds, but I think we could do like the <laughs> afternoon drive time. Sure. So if somebody, somebody out there who listens to the program is a super fan, like, and you got an uncle or a cousin who works for like Sirius or something like that, just tell them like this guy Jason and his team is good. And let's just do one week test uh-huh. of doing like drive time. Like when somebody's on vacation, like how funny would that be to just do a drive time show where we talked about anything, like what was on TV last night or the debates. It'd be just like totally off topic stuff. I'm in. It'd be funny. It would be funny. Hey, uh, I'm speaking about how great the show is doing. Uh, we just did our terms of service over. And if you guys may not know this, but if your terms of service on your site is not tight and right, uh, you are going to get sued. It's happening over and over again. And you forget, hey, terms of service, what are those? Then you hire a lawyer to do your terms of service, and it costs five dimes, ten dimes, and it wastes all your time. There is a great service called Snap Terms that we found to do our terms of service. We spoke with these folks. They're brilliant. And the the way, go to thisweekend.com slash legal, and you'll see our um, um, terms of service. And this was done with Snap Terms, and it's very simple. It's affordable. It's really fast. It's only 149 bucks to do this, or a little bit more if you get a bigger site. Uh, and when you go there, you put in what you do, and then they make your terms of service, but then they do like little things to make it funny and interesting so people actually read it uh, and understand it in plain English. And instead of spending three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 to do your terms of service, you can just spend $149 or something like that. And if you go and you use the uh, coupon code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, you'll get a free NDA. And you, everybody always needs an NDA to have to give out to people. And if you get it, you ask your lawyer for an NDA. He's like, sure, I'll give you a lawyer for four thousand. I'll give you an NDA for $4,000, $2,000. The second you call, you're going to be like on the hook for thousands of dollars. And I told all my startups in my portfolio of 25 companies, including GDG, which one of them, Peter's company, Hey, you got to get Snap Terms going if you don't already have a Terms of Service. And if you do have a Terms of Service and you got to update it, try Snap Terms. The service is brilliant, and that's all they do. So you know how, like, you know, you can go like steal somebody's. Mm-hmm. Not a good idea, you know, because mm-hmm. you could get sued for doing that, mm-hmm. and it might have their stuff in it. Snap Terms. This is all they do. You go to their site. You order Snap Terms. Look at the easy pricing. They price it based upon, uh, you know, if you want mobile and coupons and all this other kind of stuff. And here's all the different. Um, you know, turn around. You can do it just in a couple of days. Um, and revisions take, uh, you get to do revisions as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, they've been featured on a bunch of different services, and the testimonials are just great. Everybody loves the service who uses it. Everybody check out at Snap Terms and say, hey, you should just welcome them to the program for supporting it. So everybody on your Twitter account, it's your Geary, say welcome at Snap Terms. Terms. Uh, great job, guys. And let me introduce our uh, guest, Peter Rojas, uh, my partner on Engadget, uh, the creator of Engadget, um, which I get a lot of credit for, but the fact is Peter did all the work, and also the creator of Gizmodo, which Nick Denton takes a lot of credit for, but Peter actually <laughs> created. Peter, uh, welcome to the program, now with Gadget, GD, GD. Thanks. Com. Thanks for having me back. It's always great to be on. Yeah, and we got a lot of news to talk about this week. Obviously, a big deal with Surface and the iPad Mini, so I know that you're tracking this stuff. Um, it's your expertise. <laughs> it's, but been a, it's been a difficult week for me. It's been a difficult week for you. A lot, not a lot of sleep, huh? Yeah, not a lot of sleep. Uh, and also with us, Marshall Kirkpatrick um, is with us from Portland on the uh, GoTo meeting, and he is with Little Bird. How is uh, GetLittleBird.com doing, Marshall? It's doing great. We've been working in secrecy for a long time until uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and now we've unveiled the product, and we're letting people come in and test it out. We're getting great feedback. And what does the product do in a sentence or two? We discover the top experts and influencers on any topic online and help you engage with them, their content. So in a way, it's like clout, but a little bit more sophisticated from what I've understood for some of the beta beta testers. That's the the first example that a lot of people bring up, uh, but we think that clout is more complementary and competitive uh, because we do do more discovery and tools, and they do more uh, ranking in terms of absolute popularity. And, and you got Mark Cuban to invest in your company. Yeah, we just announced that on the 5th that we had closed a, a million-dollar round of funding led by Mark Cuban, uh, which is just fantastic. We've got a bunch of other really cool investors participating as well. Uh, Hab Lindzen is uh, another big investor, uh, Dharma Shah J. Bear. Uh, quite a few awesome, awesome people. But Mark has, 
Mark really gave us a big vote of confidence and has been really said and wonderful to work with. Hey, I'd love to um, get you guys. Uh, I would love to get into the. Uh, I would love to get into the beta, and I hey might be interested as an angel investor. Let's go to the first story, Tyler. First you're going to read the news. I am. So first story this week, Apple had a big uh, new press event. At which they launched, amongst other things, the new 13-inch MacBook Pro Retina, the new super-thin iMac, the new Mac Mini, but most notably the iPad Mini, which is 7.2 millimeters thick, 0.68 pounds, 7.inch, 9-inch, 7.9-inch display, same resolution as an iPad 2. Uh, the real question is it was priced at 329 and the, the big question is, is 329 the right price point, or should ha have Apple gone to a lower price point, like 249 299 Yeah, I expected a much different price, and I it feels like a huge mistake. Uh, but maybe they're just going to drop the price post-Christmas, and they're just going to price gouge people for the next 90 days. Peter, what's going on here? Why are they launching a competitor to the $199 Kindle mm -hmm. and the $199 uh, Nexus 7 for almost double the price? Uh, because they're still going to sell as many as they can make. Uh, you know, the iPod, the iPad is now a, a huge franchise for them, and a lot of people want to buy them. In fact, they're basically selling as many as they can make uh, of the of the 9.7 inch ones. And so, I think anything that makes it easier and more affordable to buy an iPad is going to do really well. And I'd be surprised if they they weren't uh, if they don't sell out the initial run uh, pretty quickly. And, and even at that price, I mean, it's it's it is more. But I think that people do still perceive um, there being a, a difference in quality, and um, and it is Apple, and a lot of people are really invested in that ecosystem, and so they're, they're going to find it a really attractive alternative. And the truth is, Google and Apple are either, Google and Amazon are either losing a little bit of money or basically breaking even on those two devices. So Apple makes their money correct me if I'm wrong on the profit margin of the device, not on the services on the device. They really don't make yeah, for, yeah, for the most part. I mean, I, they obviously do make some money from selling apps and content and things like that. But for, for, for the most part, their their profits come from uh, the margin on the devices. And Amazon and Google have a, have a different strategy there and, and they're pricing their hardware uh, differently. I think that, um, you know, Apple, they're a pretty smart company. And, and, and uh, I think that they, you know, ran the numbers and realized that they could price it at 329 and sell as many as, as they, I mean, it's not like they would, they would uh, somehow sell more at 299 or sell more at 249 because there's just going to be a limit to how many they can produce initially. And so Apple is essentially constrained by not the price of the products, but how many they can make at this point. Uh, well, I think I think so. I mean, there was definitely a point where Apple products were a really significant premium over everything else in the space. Um, if you remember how, what a MacBook Air cost when it first came out, I mean, you basically had to drop close to two grand if you wanted to buy one. And now you can start. I think the cheapest one is nine ninety nine or, or ten ninety nine or something like that. Yeah. And so, um, uh, and it's the same thing with tablets. I mean, you know, people if the iPad had started at six ninety nine. Or, or something like that. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily have surprised people given historically that Apple products have, have gone for a premium. But Apple's gotten so good at their supply chain and have so much cash to throw at their suppliers to, to bring component costs down and things like that, and it becomes so much more efficient yeah. that they are able to price things really competitively compared with, with where uh, uh, they were you know, a few years ago. Where the, if you think about like, you know, the iPod when it first came out was more expensive than everything else out there. Yeah, the, I mean, the, and the, in fact, the iPod was the price of the iPhone. So basically, you're getting an iPhone thrown in with your iPod when you buy today. Um, Marshall, what do you think of this uh, price brouhaha? And did you order the mini? Is it something you want? Do you think the seven inch is going to be more successful than the, you know, 11 inch? I haven't ordered one. I've used a smaller tablet and a Galaxy Tab, and it was fun as a novelty. But I am concerned that, um, you know, for me, one of my big interests is uh, the well-being of the web. Uh, and the, there's a lot of people that are concerned that apps uh, are going to smush the free and open web where a lot of people can publish easily. And, uh, and mobile analysts say that the smaller the tablet get, the less web browsing happened on them and uh, in favor of using apps instead. So I'm not sure that that uh, the smaller iPad is necessarily going to be as exciting to consumers uh, or great for the web in the long run. That's a fascinating point. So as the as the profile shrinks, the web just looks super ugly on it, 
And actually, I think that Phil Schiller said that in that email that came out in the Samsung Discovery, that it worked really well for email, it worked really well for reading books, but maybe the web surfing is a little bit ganky because people haven't really optimized their sites for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Peter, is this really going to be an issue, you think, going forward, that the, 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 the ascent of the iOS operating system is going to cause the demise of free publishing on the web? Is that actually happening right now? It feels like it's... You know, uh, I think that there is a shift towards apps. Absolutely. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, there's always sort of the hope that HTML5 is going to get good enough in mobile browsers that you can um, sidestep uh, some of the, the the App Store stuff, you know, some of the restrictions of the App Store. And we have seen that in, in certain cases, right? Um, when Amazon had some issues with the Kindle app and iOS, they introduced their web-based reader, um, which created a pretty good experience. And then they brought the Kindle app back and solved some of those issues. Um, that Apple, some of the complaints Apple had about about how they were selling Kindle books through the uh, the Kindle app and things like that. So, um, you know, I think there's always going to be that tension, and I think that the Marshall is a good point that that apps are starting to subsume a lot of those experience. I think my general sense is that what's going on is that the pie is still growing in terms of people's device usage overall. So even if mo I think that mobile web usage is probably growing in in absolute terms. It's just that in relative terms, people are just doing more things on their devices than just web browsing now. They're doing, they're, and, and a lot of those things are happening within apps. And, and that's just, well, in this, I mean, that's just gonna in this case, though, I'm sorry if you, I, I don't mean to, to interrupt, but if I, if I could, I, uh, there are absolute numbers. Uh, Luke Bluski, the uh, mobile UX. Uh, industry leader uh, published a, a collection of studies recently that said, in absolute terms, the number of web pages visited in the browser by uh, a user of a seven-inch tablet is substantially uh, fewer than the, yeah. than the number of pages visited in a, a nine or ten-inch tablet. Yeah, that may be. I, mean, I, I, I certainly think that makes sense. I'm just saying I think that mobile web usage is probably just growing overall. And what impact is the LTE having on all of this, Peter? I mean. I was shocked. You had been telling me about LTE because you had an Android phone and I was on iOS last year and how transformative that was. I didn't really get it until my iPhone 5 came and I'm on Verizon LTE. Yeah. I was getting 20 megabit down and 30 megabit up when I was on the 405 doing 70 miles an hour. And I will tell you, I was a passenger in an Uber, not driving at the time. <laughs> okay, how good. big is LTE? Uh, LTE is going to be pretty uh, pretty significant, I think, because it does um, make a. I mean, if you think about these, are just you know connected computers at this point. Anything that makes uh, that experience better and more seamless is going to increase usage uh, across the board. Uh, and, I, and I think it's just in the same way that when we saw um, you know the deployment of, of broadband in people's homes, they use their computers a lot more because using the web was a much more pleasurable experience than on a dial. Are the LTE networks going to get as foobarred as the 3G networks did? So is this just like temporary, you know, speed enhancement, or is this going to be a permanent speed enhancement? Well, LTE is much more efficient at using uh, those networks. It's a much more efficient network technology than than 3G, uh, generally speaking. And so, um, the, actually, the, the the carriers are very interested in getting people off of 3G and onto LTE because it does actually make it easier for them to handle all that capacity. Now, the thing is, they're not going to tell you that because they want to charge you more um, for something that actually is, is more efficient at using their network. That's so it's saving them it. money and, and it's lowering their cost, but they're charging more for it. Marshall, what do you think about LTE? Is your device LTE now? Do you think that's going to be transformative for a company like, say, YouTube, which the inside information I'm having is uh, that I was getting from some people was that YouTube is seeing a magnitude jump in consumption of videos now that LTE is hitting on the iPhone. Oh, that makes sense. I, I don't have any specific knowledge on that other than, uh, you know, I, I know that video, consumption video is one of the most compelling user experiences on mobile. So I, I'm sure it'll happen more as more people produce high quality content uh, like your own network, you know, look out networks because uh, here comes lots of data. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're going to see, Tyler, is the concept of watching Netflix or streaming Hulu uh, or watching shows on YouTube or, you know, is going to catch up with what we saw when we were in mm -hmm. Japan Asia. and Korea. Yeah. And, you know, every taxi driver yeah. was watching a soap opera or sports 
while we were driving in their car mm -hmm. over their phones. In some cases, it was over the air data services, other cases, IP, but they have the networks there, mm -hmm. and people are walking around or on the subway. They were either playing a game on Gree or something like that, or on Docomo in Japan, and, or they were watching TV or watching a movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be the video revolution. I to think. Marshall's point, Phil, in the keynote, right. did break out a special section to talk about the browsing experience on the iPad mini versus the other tablet devices. Yeah. Saying it had twice as much like browser visibility. Yeah, I don't know if I'd buy that. I mean, I just think I the browser paradigm, the, 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 the layout of web pages is such that, you know, when you have the top bar for your banner ad, the right-hand side for your marquee, th this, the, the body of the text is so, you know, poorly laid out for a mobile experience that when you start getting a narrow device like this, it's screwed. I mean, you're going to have to think about a one-column layout, and everybody has a three-column layout, right? Mm -hmm. The left hand is the navigation, the right hand is promotion and navigation, the middle is the content. There's very few sites that have just one straight column of content. Uh, even Twitter is now two columns, right? So it, it is a major issue for these, and people are going to have to redo their um, sites. Let's hear the next story. So the, uh, the former day trader in me loves this next one. Apple's quarter four earnings uh, missed the mark on Wall Street. Uh, they came in with $36 billion in revenue for Q4, with mm. an, although expected $35.8, so there was, they were slightly ahead there. Um, but the earnings per share came in at 8.67, when the uh, Wall Street expected 8.75, which is a considerable miss. Uh, iPhone sales are up... Is that a considerable miss, 1%? Uh, yeah, that's a considerable miss. Okay. T 10 cents on $8 is a considerable miss. One, okay. ce one cent is, can be, is considered a miss. Like it's, Why is that? Why do people care so much? Is it, I mean, who cares? What you, if they just bought a data center? If you, yeah, I know, but as, as far as the Wall Street types are concerned, like if you come in above... What you want to do, ideally... Who sets that estimate, though? It's Wall Street's estimate. Yeah, it is. It's the sentiment of the street, yes. So what happens is, is you want to come in... 10 cents above what the street is expecting. Yeah. That's what you're aiming for as the CEO of the company. Right. So when um, you come in under, it's when, a really big deal. Yes. Yeah. It's not, a, not I, normal. I never got that. Okay. So what's the bottom line? The what's bottom the line is, well, let's, let's dive into it. iPhone sales are up 58% year over year. iPad That's sales. That's unbelievable. I know, right? iPhone sales are up 58% year over year. Yeah. iPad sales up 26% year that over year. That seems low to me. Should be more. Mac sales only up 1% year over year. That's anemic. Uh, but is it up only 1%, Peter, because everybody's buying iPhones and iPads and they just don't see the point of upgrading their desktop? Uh, that's Yeah, I think that's probably a big part of it is that um, people are opting for uh, iPads instead of, of um, you know, laptops right now. Uh, and, and I think that what we're seeing is that, um, you know, we, we got into a phase in sort of maybe the middle of the last decade where um, households were saying, well, we'll have, it's affordable for us to have two or three PCs in the house. And uh, now, you know, a lot of people, when that, that oldest PC, you know, died or needed to be replaced, they bought an iPad instead. And so it's not that they're not going to buy lap another laptop ever again. It's that, um, you know, they're not necessarily feeling, feeling the urgency to buy another laptop anytime soon. They're going to wait until, uh, uh, you know, those, 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 exci those cycles are extending. And yeah, I so agree with that. Like, I, I did buy the new iMac because anytime they come up with a new design for the iMac, I get it. I'm kind of an idiot. I bought the iPad mini, I bought the iPad 4 or whatever they're calling it, and I bought the iPad and the new iMac. But it's been years, like two years maybe since I upgraded my iMac. And I don't really feel, like I don't care about my desktop computer anymore. I'm like, if I can surf the web and get a browser going in it, that's all I care about. I don't play games there anymore. I play games on my iPad. I don't really do anything that's compute intensive. And those, I think these are going to be like, people are going to upgrade their computers every six or seven years, which I think spells doom for Dell and other people who make those things. It's over. Uh, but keep going. Uh, well, the question is, will the new devices um, that are released before Christmas be enough to um, oh, yeah. cover the lift in revenue? I got to think 100%. What do you think, Marshall? Oh, I think uh, I've got something to say about just about uh, every topic uh, today, but this is one I got to defer to, uh, to Peter in particular on. <laughs> yeah. Peter, what do you uh, think? They're going to make up know, for it, obviously, in Q4 with this, all this whole new line of devices? It's hard. I mean, it's hard not to see sales in, improving when you basically completely refresh your product line and you're a company like Apple. Um, you know, I don't worry about Apple that much. Uh, they seem to be doing just fine. Uh, if they, they missed their earnings, that's, I don't think it was by that much. Um, yeah. And if you think about just the sheer volume of, of earnings of profit that they're generating, 
Uh, and you look at other companies like Amazon, which are, are just scraping by, or you know Google, um, which are all you know doing. I mean, well, when you think about it, but it's it's still Apple is a uh, uh, um, you know Apple is a magnitude office. magnitude more yeah, profitable. They're just, a, they're, they're just at a different scale right now than everybody else. It's an un otherworldly scale. Just looking at it, they now have a hundred and ten or a hundred twenty billion dollars in cash. They're the largest yep. hedge fund in the world. They could buy, somebody tweeted, they could buy a space station now. I don't know, you know, some of the blogs obviously wrote that or made that comparison. But if you just look at the, the prices of companies like Yahoo, Pandora, I mean, they could just go buy Yahoo, Pandora, you know, they could buy 10 meaningful companies. I'm not talking about buying $50 million, $100 million, you know, pre-IPO. They could buy Groupon. They could buy Zynga. They could buy Yahoo. They could buy everything on the market. And they are not doing any M&A, which is fascinating to me. I mean, you're well, very for, small M&A. Except &A. for color, right? What's that? <laughs> except for color, right? Yeah, but they paid $5 million to get a group no, of I, engineers I, I, who I'm, make I'm apps. Just make, I'm just making a joke. But yeah. I, I do think that, um, you know, what's funny to me is, is when, you, when you talk about the, 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 the issues and challenges they're facing around TVs, right, about, about getting into the, the, the television market. Um, I mean, they could just buy Dish. I mean, that's a... You know, that's a sub twenty billion dollar buy for them, and so yeah. they have a satellite television business. Yeah, they could have Direct TV or Dish or something. That would be transformative. If when you turned on Direct TV or Dish, and they're talking about people who have tens of millions of subscribers in the United States, if they owned one of those, and you turned on your Dish network, and an Apple logo came up, and your iTunes was there, and your season passes were there, oh my God! And if Angry Birds was there, but it doesn't seem like they like to do that. They have that syndrome, don't they? Of not made here. I'll, I'll well, the other way to look at it is. Go ahead, Marshall. Another way to look at it is, uh, as Steve Jobs used to say, innovation means saying no to thousands of things. Yeah, that is fair. I mean, he did, he was pretty disciplined about that. Hey, let me take a moment here um, to tell you about another great product. That's Mailchimp. Mailchimp. Oh my God. I was telling somebody today. They said they wanted to be an influencer, and they said, "How should I be an influencer?" And I said, "It's very simple to be an influencer." He, he works with the publishing business. I said, get the top 20. You, have, you work with the top, he works with like the top 100 publishers. I said, get the top 50, 100 magazine publishers, put them on a MailChimp list, and then email them this weekend the three most interesting things you've seen in, you know, whatever topic people are buzzing about. And I said, oh, they're talking about like interactive, like um, ad campaigns where they're doing like sort of like the federated media, conversational media stuff. I said, okay, just write about those three things and email it to those 50 or 100 people in a plain text email. And then at the end say, if anybody knows any other great examples, let me know, I'll share it with the group. Uh, and if you don't want to um, get my infrequent passionate updates, just click here to unsubscribe. Just start like a 25 person mailing list. And he was like, oh my God, that's so genius. And I, he said, how do I do it? I said, it's very simple, you go to MailChimp. He's like, oh, right, MailChimp. <laughs> That's it. And I told him, the free plan is always free. 12,000 emails per month, 2,000 subscribers. Free, 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 free. Why free? For that many emails and for such a great service? Because they know that you're going to grow using their service because email is a secret weapon. Peter's got a, a gadget, what, 250,000 emails on the list? We've got a pretty big email list at this point, yeah. It's hundreds we, uh, of thousands of people. Yeah. And I get your email, and I, 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 like it pulls me back in. Like All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, yeah, I haven't been to Gadget in a couple of days. Oh, there's an interesting discussion that Ryan wrote about, or, or Peter's writing about something. It pulls me right back in, and people respond. I don't know, Peter, how, many, how do people respond when you write one of those emails? Uh, the open rate is really high, and the click-through rate is way above industry averages from what MailChimp's analytics tell us. Right, and the analytics is the best part. You can start to understand. And so if you write a stinker of an email, you can look back on your 10 emails and be like, oh, when I wrote this thing, nobody opened it, and people unsubscribed. But when I wrote this, people forwarded it to a friend, or they uh, opened it multiple times. All this great stuff is available. And let me tell you something. Building these kind of things yourself is ridiculous. MailChimp is constantly releasing new awesome features like the mobile-friendly email templates, which we use on the launch ticker. MailChimp makes it very easy with drag-and-drop file uploading. There is no contract. There is no trial. The free plan is always free. They're so confident that you're going to love the product that you pay as you go. You don't need to sign a two-year contract like some of those other those bastards make you sign.
They didn't say bad. Mailchimp didn't put bastards here. That was but I got, you, that's you me. Put that, you put that in. There. I hate those bastards who make you sign them. When somebody says that to me, I just call them out. I'm like, I, I just cross it out in a contract. If somebody, I'm like, absolutely not. What, what, what decade are you living in? Is it 1987 that you've got to try to lock me down to a five-year deal? If your product's good, I use it. If your product's not good, I stop using it. That's software as a service at the pinnacle. The best players do it that way, and Mailchimp is the leader in their category. Thank you, Mailchimp, for making a great product. That makes my life very, very good. Easy. Hey, uh, next story. Sure. Uh, enough with the um, enough with the, uh, the the Facebook nonsense. I'm not I mean the um, the Wall Street nonsense. Let's talk about uh, okay. maybe the Surface. Microsoft releases the Surface. Ah. 10.6 inch clear type display, micro SD card slot behind the kickstand, USB port, and whatnot. Xbox Music Service comes with a Surface. It can push video to an Xbox, very similar to Apple's AirPlay. Mm -hmm. Starting at 499 for the 32 gigabyte without a keyboard and uh, just another 100 for the keyboard. That's kind of the innovation there. It's like the tablet with an additional keyboard cover yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, how will the Surface do in this gray area between <laughs> laptop and tablet? How will it compare to the iPad and other tablets? And will people cash out uh, the extra 100 bucks? What do, you, what do you think? What do you think, Peter? Is this thing DOA? Is it all? Oh, there it is. Whoa. And what do you yeah. think so far? Uh, okay, so, um, you know, I've been writing down my thoughts today, actually. And there are a few things that are really great about it. Um, I mean, that actually, this touch cover thing, I don't know yeah. if you guys can see We can it. see it. Yeah, perfect. Um, look how thin this is. It, it's, it's looks actually, like it's like a, It looks like it's a legal pad if you used yeah. up all the yellow paper. It's like not much thicker than the um, smart cover on the iPad. It in looks fact, like the cover on the actually. iPad, yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's smart cover and size, but you get a keyboard. Yeah, and I actually, I was surprised. I was really skeptical. I'm like, this is going to be terrible to type on. But I found I could type really well right away. And, I, and with, I'm sure with practice, I'll get actually pretty fast on it. Yeah. Um, much better experience than I I'd expected. I actually think that this is probably the best, the, the touch cover is probably the best innovation uh, of the whole thing. And it's actually pretty sturdy. I mean, you can hold it, you know, upside down. It like doesn't that. just release like the Apple cover, right? It's, it's locked no, it's on. Not, it's, it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight. Um, you know, the, so I think one of the things that that's complicated about the story of the surface is that there is the version that's running windows RT, which just came out. And then there's the version the the pro, which is going to come with the full version of windows eight, uh, in a few months. And, the relationship between Windows RT and, and full-blown Windows 8 is actually kind of complicated to understand, unless you are following this, which is Windows RT is it's kind of, it's just the mobile interface. It runs on ARM processors, which is a mobile processor, and it only runs apps designed specifically for Windows RT for, this, for the mobile interface. So like regular Windows apps won't install, it's a more limited experience. And, you know, frankly, for what they're trying to do with the Surface, which is positioned as sort of like a, a, a laptop or a PC with all this great tablet stuff baked into it, I think you're better off waiting for the, the Pro, which is will give you that more full, which could actually legitimately maybe replace a laptop right. or, and your tablet, whereas this feels a little bit too in between and I think leans a little too heavy on the, the PC side, actually. I wanted Microsoft to kind of go either go all the way and just jettison a lot of the, the, the PC, the legacy PC stuff. Uh, and also it's a little, I don't want to say it's heavy, but it actually, given what its weight is, it actually feels a little heavier, you know, in your hands. It looks it, a little thick. I mean, it looks like a half of an, uh, of a ThinkPad. It looks like it's probably a third bigger than, uh, an iPad. It's maybe, yeah, it's maybe slightly thicker and, and it's, it's actually longer and it's very difficult to hold in the portrait orientation because it's so, it's it a falls 16 over. by nine screen. Yeah. So it's not as comfortable or easy to use, you know, as an iPad. And so... There are things I like about it. I mean, I, I find the interface to be, um, you know, it's pretty nice. I mean, I always like the Windows Phone interface, and it's very similar to that. Yeah. Uh, there's still not a lot of apps for it, but the apps that I have used, like the Netflix app, is amazing. It's really great. And so and, uh, is this an app for enterprises that don't want to deploy iPads but or have a bunch of VPs and directors saying, we need a tablet solution that, you know, syncs with, you know, Office and all these yeah. other, you know, um, directory so, yeah, services? I, I wouldn't buy this one. I would buy the Pro, right, right. which is a little thicker. It's going to have a higher resolution screen. Um, this has the 1366 by 768 screen, which just doesn't look as good as the iPad screen, but the mm -hmm. Surface Pro has a higher resolution screen. Uh, but you know, so it, it, if I had to... I would. Don't, I mean, it's going to be more expensive, the Pro. But if that's what you want, I would. If you really want something that can sort of replace your laptop, I would wait for that one. So Apple is not in any 
uh, this isn't going to take any meaningful market share from Apple, or it's going to take meaningful market share from laptop providers like Dell. Well, I, I think that this is sort of the the the, the big question. Is is I think that Microsoft it wants to real wants to shift into being a devices and services business. And they want to, and they realize that they're two big franchises, which is Windows and Office, are not. They're not going to. They're not going to. The, the, their best days are behind them. Maybe the best way to look at them. But there's right. still going to be a lot of growth. They're going to. They're still throwing off huge amounts of profit, but the the growth phase is really over, and they're trying to figure out how do they transition to this to being you know in some ways more like Apple, right? right. They're going to and they're going to do. I'm sure Microsoft will do a phone. Uh, why isn't the that, why don't they call it the since they have such an amazing foothold in Xbox and I think Ryan from Gadget may have pointed this out why don't they just call it like the Xbox tablet or the Xbox phone and just take that franchise and extend it on a consumer basis they came up with the Zune if it was the Xbox music player wouldn't it have done better and be easier for people to understand uh, that might have been something that, that worked a little bit better now they finally do have Xbox music as a service which is built right. into uh, and all this, and I think they want to preserve Xbox as sort of an entertainment brand, huh. and they felt like they wanted to, you know, build off of uh, the Windows legacy with with what they're doing here. I, 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 in some ways, I respect Microsoft for taking a really big bet and 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 being being willing to to make a bold move with the new user interface. Yeah, uh, and I think that you know, baking it into Windows, um, even if there's this weird, there's one version, this legacy desktop user interface, and then there's this new tablet interface. It's a little confusing and, and a little little kludgy, but I think that is probably in the balance. Maybe probably they had to do something like that. Yeah. It's just that the Windows RT thing is, feels a little weird to me. Like I would have rather that they had scaled up Windows Phone OS into a tablet and just said, you know what, we're going to not license this to anybody or we're only going to license it to a small number of OEMs who can make really great hardware for it. Uh, I, I mean, if you think about it, the iPad is successful because it's it's the it's the iPhone scaled up into a tablet. It's not a MacBook scaled down into a tablet. Yeah, you have and to I sort of build the, up from what's working on yeah. mobile into the tablet. That's a really good point, Marshall. Microsoft best days behind them, or is this a sign that they can innovate and they can build something that actually is really beautiful and that you know people like Peter actually respect and are intrigued by? I mean, it's this is the first time I think I've heard you know, really serious hardware people really love a Microsoft product in a long time. Not, you know, maybe Xbox and Connect were, you know, two things they loved. And now we've got a tablet that they actually seem to love. Well, that's that's great. I'm, they're surely nobody to take lightly, but it's a, a real high bar to catch up with the user experience and the, the compelling design of Apple products. I mean, this this tablet sounds intriguing, but uh, I don't know why I would want something bigger than my iPad, but smaller than my Air, uh, other than to to experiment with. Do you think that there's an opportunity, though, to have those two devices become one, Marshall? No, I not necessarily. I I feel like I use the both of them for different purposes at different times, and I feel pretty comfortable with that. Um, you know the the iPad is really handy to hold in in all kinds of different ways, uh, but the the Air feels heavy duty enough and uh, and yet light enough. I I uh, I feel just fine having both plus a phone. I'm getting a little annoyed carrying both, and I find some trips I never take my MacBook Air out, and I find other trips when I don't bring my MacBook Air, I'm like, oh, I wanted to write something, and I just don't have a great keyboard for it. And I bought the Logitech keyboard. I bought literally three different of these keyboards that connect over Bluetooth. There is something about Bluetooth that, and connecting over that that just sucks. And typing It's a little laggy, it, those keyboards on, I, I think the Bluetooth keyboards on the iPad can be a little laggy, I find. The lag is disgusting. Like it defeats, the whole purpose of using a keyboard is to go fast and get back to 80, 90, 100 words a minute, which is what I type. And then I get on, it's like, why did I buy this device? This is a terrible experience. And I, I think we've lost the concept of typing. And I was on the phone with the BlackBerry folks just the other day talking about some business development stuff. I'm not going to talk about what that was. But I was telling them, I think the industry, and I mean this sincerely, because people don't have a keyboard anymore, and nobody will make a keyboard Android phone or a keyboard uh, iOS device, people are not writing long, intelligent, clear, concise emails anymore. Everybody's writing misspelled, autocorrected, one-liners, and like, 
you get some board member, right? Peter, uh, like <laughs> sending some message off their iPad or off their iPhone and it makes no freaking sense. And in the Blackberry days, people would write like a four bullet point response and you couldn't tell if they're on their desktop or if they're on their Blackberry. That's why I still keep a Blackberry with me. And when you see anybody who's a serious CEO or venture capitalist, they take out two phones. Dave Goldberg from SurveyMonkey, boom, two phones on the table. I, he has the Blackberry for typing serious stuff. He's got the iPhone for doing apps and surfing the web. Every serious person I know has both of those, and you have to have a keyboard. These these digit these these mock whatever they on screen keyboards don't work. I don't you know. know Am I right or no, wrong? I, I, you know, Swift Key on Android is awesome, and I can type really quickly with it now. Uh, how how close to your Trio uh, 650 or your? I actually think it's probably better at this point because the prediction it, it actually it, it it does prediction and it learns from your typing style, and you can actually l link it to your Twitter account and to your gmail account and stuff like that and have it pull in which program is that swift key it's for android only and the prediction the way it does predictive text is just uh, it's so good it actually doesn't it's not like ios where it's just sort of generic predictions based on one dictionary yeah it actually does predictions based on what you write so if you tend to write you know if you if you write uh you know jason it'll do calcanus as your next word as the prediction Wow! It's just, you just hit the, the space bar and it comes in and actually really increased my typing speed a lot. And I find that, um, you know, I, I can type about as fast with it as I can with the, with the phone with the keyboard. Uh, right. So now something that like it's something that iPhone owners are not, uh, you know, are experiencing. This is uh, the and thing I find about the iOS. The iPhone is a nightmare. Well, this is the iOS um, sort of dilemma. When you lock a piece of software down. The way Apple tends to do, you have no innovation occurring. So to make a, sep a keyboard software, they don't allow that, correct? They do not allow that. And so it, uh, stupid. You have to jailbreak it, basically. See, this is where Apple gets me so infuriated sometimes, and I have friends over there. They have to let go of this you know, control freak nature with certain things. They, and and they, it's almost like the market has to beat them into submission on it. They finally allowed other people to have a browser, right? Finally, then they kicked one of those um, phone apps, app, the picture apps out for using the volume control as a snap for a mm -hmm. photo. I don't know which app that was. And then they put that in the very next version of how you take pictures on the iPhone 4S. <laughs> you remember that, Peter? Yeah, I do. Remember. I can't remember who that was, but, but it, it's it just, happened. It's um. so lame. And I just had to come up with another app on iOS. I'm trying to remember. Oh, Dragon, which has the best dictation. It just crushes Siri came out with a, an assistant for Android that allows you to launch other apps and do things in other apps. So you can say launch um, launch path, uh, check in, Mahalo, and it does it, right? Like, holy cow. And now, all you can do with Siri, I think Siri now allows you to, to launch another app, but you can't do the first command. How great would it be to launch Waze, navigate home? But Apple won't let you do that. Siri's got to be locked down. And Apple won't let you put a Siri competitor on there because nobody else is allowed to listen for, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Marshall, what do you think about the lockdown iOS system cramping innovation? I would love to see innovation in dialers and keypads and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But I, I can't help but have this lingering doubt in the back of my mind. Um, when I think about the, the weekend that I jailbroke my iPad, and there just is not much out there that real that people have taken the trouble to build that's really very interesting. And the the Swift key replacement, which is would be wonderful to have on an iPad, um, is so broken that it's it's just unusable. And there's you know why why haven't people built that? I wonder. Well, because what's the percentage of the people who want to jailbreak their phone? Yeah, it's just too the market's too small. That's sure, but just for utility, some really simple version of it. Uh, the the one that's on there, if you've seen it, is is ninety percent of the way there already, and the the last ten percent is by, a killer. But by if you're a developer and Apple keeps you know taking the jailbreaking and making it harder and harder, and all your resources are in how to like route around the big fence they're putting up, as opposed to making the software better, and you're spending ninety percent of your time trying to get on the device, or ninety nine percent, and one percent building the product, that, that's just disheartening. What really Apple should do is put, when, when you have an unauthorized app loading, it should say, this is an unauthorized or experimental app. Would you, are you sure you want to do it? Go to your settings and allow unauthorized apps, which, by the way, they started doing on their desktop, 
when I tried to download like one of these third-party utilities, it's like, this is something from not from the Apple Store. Are you sure you want to load it? And you had to go to your oh, settings yeah. and actually say, I'm okay with loading Google Canary. That's kind of, you know, they're, they're tightening up the desktop to yep. be more like iOS, right, Peter? That's exactly what they're doing. And, and I, I mean, I'm not sure that this is something that's going to happen anytime soon, but it's a legitimate concern that, that they might just lock down uh, the Mac OS completely and just say, no, you, know, you, have to, you can only install apps from the Apple Store. I, I don't think that's going to happen, no. but it's certainly a possibility. And now that they've, I mean, they've baked it into uh, uh, the OS so that they could do that. One of the nice things about Android is that they do, um, you know, you can't install an unauthorized app, or unauthor you know, unsigned code uh, without going into your settings and, and marking that um, as something, as one of your preferences. And, and I think there's nothing, I think in theory, I mean, Apple could do the same thing and just make it a little bit of a hurdle, not something that the average person is going to mess with or have set uh, by, you know, don't set it by default, make it something that you have to go in and do and take, you know, some, all these risks and say you're avoiding your warranty and all this, you know, whatever. And they could do that. I mean, actually, you know, Ryan Block asked that of Steve Jobs at an Apple press conference um, a few years ago. And uh, it wasn't, ex you know, there wasn't a lot of interest in that, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, you know, that's when Steve Jobs made that famous statement about how there was, um, uh, they wanted to keep porn from kids. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's uh, like, really? I mean, the iPad is built for porn, you know? Like, <laughs> that is like the porn device. Like, oh, yeah, you're in bed. Here's your, here's your iPad, like, you know, for por browsing porn. I mean, that's kind of strange. Next story. Uh, next story. New York City Metro Authority releasing uh, train arrival data to developers. Genius. Never before have riders been able to see live train information without having to go into the station. Love it. To be like a subway countdown clock in your pocket. By the end of the year, numbered line riders will be able to get next train arrival times by downloading the MTA app. MTA also will be looking into private sector to help riders get the best apps with up-to-the-minute train information. So the question is, how well can the government do this versus private sector developers? What do you think, Peter? You're a New Yorker. How great I mean, is I this? I think this is great. I think that one of the things that, from what I understand, that, that the MTA is, is kind of recognizing is that I think I actually believe they hired someone specifically charged with, um, you know, releasing this data and, and letting it out there via APIs and kind of realizing that rather than them building all these apps, uh, that it'd be better to, to take the data, which I mean, it's not like there's a, a, a it's not like the MTA makes more money by hoarding the data. Um, you know, it doesn't increase ridership for them to not put the data out there. And uh, and so I think that, that philosophically they do want to do this. And I think they've, they've actually done it. A decent job, considering that it's a, an underfunded government agency, uh, you know, getting that stuff out there in a way that people can use it. It's got to be cheaper, too, to just provide the API than it is to update an app constantly. When you think about it, mm -hmm. they do need to increase ridership because their budget's based on that, and it's a fixed-cost business. And I tell you, being a New Yorker, I can't tell you how many times I sat on that goddamn Lincoln Center, you know, B train and waited 20, 40 minutes for a train sometimes at 10 o'clock at night coming home from Fordham and froze my cojones off and if i knew the train was coming in 19 minutes i would have just stayed in study hall for 15 and then walked to the train this is massive it's massive and if you people used to wait on union square station or 34th street for the green lines because it was so hot down there in the summer it would go to 110 degrees people would be passing out you your shirt would be drenched by the time you got wherever you're going then you would go into air conditioning or you get into the subway car itself, 110 on the platform and 60 degrees in the car. You'd be getting an ammonia in August. Hmm. If you could wait and know, okay, it's coming in eight minutes, I'm going to stay above ground for seven, then I'm just going to run downstairs, slide my metro card and get in. That's a big game changer for people. And it, it would absolutely wind up in things like Google Maps, Apple Maps. Genius. Marshall, what do you think? Government releasing data like this. Well, you know what city in America has the best transit app uh, market is Portland. Right here, we've got uh, our local transit authority uh, puts out loads of data for free. They've got their own app store listing 50 different uh, mobile transit apps, and it's awesome. They're, they're really good. But in a lot of other places, uh, it can get kind of sticky. You know, uh, there was a, a story in a transit publication last, list last week about a San Francisco app developer uh, who got told that he couldn't build a, a next 
bus stop uh, app because that that data was all owned by a third party private corporation that he needed to go through a, and apply for a uh, a key and a license from and, and pay for. And in Chicago, they've got a private company that also owns the data, but the city issues API keys. So it really differs from, from city to city. Um, and uh, you might note, you know, Google Maps on the, on the old iPhone had uh, transit directions as an option. And now the, the Apple Maps doesn't. Uh, those yeah. are, are gone. So there's a, a another independent group called OpenPlans.org that funded itself this summer on Kickstarter to build a, a universal open data platform for uh, mobile transit apps. So lots and lots of stuff going on in that space. And I got to tell you, if this was five years ago in New York City and we were discussing this, the dialogue would have been, and certainly 10 years ago, this would have been the dialogue, oh my God, we can't release this data because terrorists are going to blow up trains. Peter, am I right or am I wrong? I think there would have been a little more concern about that, but um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think there's a recognition that um, you know that, that ultimately, like this data is, you know, it's the public's data in a way. I mean, it's a public service, yeah. And um, and having it out there is going to create a lot more value. Um, I think that people are also having a better, you know, are, are calmed down about some of that stuff and been more realistic about what where the real dangers are. Yeah, exactly. It's like if somebody's going to blow something up, as we saw, you know over and over again, and they just caught some scumbag who was trying to, <laughs> I love it, this guy like was talking to federal agents for like three or six months or something, and they basically like sent him to get the fertilizer, had him set up the bomb, had him drive the van. Of course, it was nobody was ever in danger. It was like fake bomb material. The bomb wasn't actually set up. And this schmuck, piece of garbage, like went to the Fed, the fed building, put the truck there, and lit the detonator. Of course, the detonator's not connected to anything. And now he's going to Guantanamo or jail or hopefully execution for life. They just killed a guy, I hope. Um, and I'm, I'm not pro-death penalty, but I am for terrorists, if they can really be proven in a court of law. But, um, you know, it, it really is nice that we're getting past, you know, the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, and hopefully this goes to data as well, where we can start thinking about due process for, you know, terrorists, you know, actually putting them to, to trial if we can. Uh, in some cases, I know it's not realistic, but also like, just um, do we need to be spying on everybody all the time? Can we can we pull back on some of this, you know, freedoms that we've given up? And I, you see it at the airports; they just got rid of the metal detectors. Like, I wouldn't go through those metal detectors after reading a survey of doctors. Remember, we read yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. In this survey of doctors, like 8.7 out of 10 doctors said they would never go through the metal detectors at the airport because they know that if the, it gets calibrated incorrectly which means somebody bumped into it or knocked it, it could put a lethal, not a lethal. A, but Jason, a those people running the security there are very highly you know, skilled, well, intelligent people happens. who when know. When you're a doctor in a hospital, they make I you mean, carry. I trust my life to those, those MTA people. I yeah. talked to a doctor about it. He said, you know, in his practice, they have to wear, the x-ray te technicians and doctors who are involved in x-rays, have to wear a, a wristband or, or a meter, and it shows how much they've been exposed to so that if it gets to a certain level, they know like, hey, something's going on. The TSA wouldn't let the TSA agents wear them. Wow. Which I guess means like they know that it's going to be too much exposure. So I was getting pat down and I was getting smacked in the nuts. And it felt like every month these guys wanted to hit my junk more and more. And I swear to God, I've been smacked in the nuts so many times. It is getting like, it's almost comical. Like, I literally brace myself at LAX. I take a deep breath, because I know when they're coming up my leg, it's going to be the whack hmm. right in your balls. And then they do the other side. Bang! And it's just... And then they're like, I'm going to pat your junk yeah. with the back of my hand. Really? And then they go like this, down, right down your brajol. Well, the, uh, you know what the hack for that is? There's a way to, there's a way to get Put out golf of balls in my underwear? No, no. When he, <laughs> when he says, sir, I'm going to use my hands and uh, my, you know... Yeah, yeah. I'm going to use the back of my hands. You just say, knock yourself out. <laughs> it's crazy. And so now they have um, realized that the metal detectors don't do anything. They can be hacked. Finally, they had them shut down at LAX, and they're putting people through the one that's not radiation, where you go like this, and it doesn't actually scan your body to show your junk to folks and your boobs. It basically just shows where it is on your body. It just shows you, like, there might be something here. Hmm. That's it. It just says there's something in his pocket. And that thing is so sensitive. I went through it. I had my boarding pass in my back pocket, and the person's like, what's in your back pocket? I'm like, nothing. They're like, sir, 
can you please check your backlog? I check it. It was my boarding pass folded in half. Hmm. That came up. Next story. Hey, Peter, uh, Marshall, ever had your nuts smacked in the last couple of months going through security? Uh, no, I always, I always but opt I, out. You opt out, Peter, every time? Yeah, but you know what's funny is um, I was uh, coming back from Boston and I flew, and because, uh, you know, they have the, uh, you know, it's not actually the metal detector. That's, that's The metal detector is actually the one that's fine. It's the, you know, the, the full scan one that's, that's dangerous yeah. and, uh, or I guess ostensibly dangerous. And um, so I always opt out. And, and when I went through security uh, last week, the TSA agent was like, oh, these are the new ones. They're actually, it's a different thing. It's, they're much safer. And I was like, whatever, I'm not, you know, I'm not listening to you. And then I get home and I'm reading about, yeah, like Logan Airport was the first one to put these new machines in that actually don't have that same radiation risk yeah. as the other ones. And so, you know, the problem is it's really, they look exactly the same as far yeah. as I could tell. And it's really hard to know which places have them, which places don't. But supposedly, I think the TSA, I, you know, here's, I'm not a conspiracy theory kind of person, but I do think that the TSA internally assessed the risks and has decided that to implement, you know, to start rolling out these other machines. Um, because I think that they just decided that whatever risk is there, is just slightly too high and that, um, you know, it's not worth it. And the I risk of out. the danger the of the radiation? The danger of the radiation, I think, and also the fact that people, you know, do opt out and it slows down the security lines and, and, yeah. and whatnot. I, I don't know. I don't know what internal calculations they made, but they're clearly switching the machines. They wouldn't switch their machines without any sort of reason, at least I hope. Yeah, they just got to profile people. They got to get, um, like, that woman well, from Homeland. Like, they the got to get that the, the way that the Israeli airports work is really interesting. Right. They uh, I've read at least that they don't you make extensive use of, of metal detectors or real formal uh, security like we do here. Uh, instead, it's a whole lot of psychological profiling and looking deep into people's eyes. Yep. Uh, like as soon as they walk. Oh, in it's, the door. And I think it's Mossad guys like army guys and Mossad guys. And if you're brown, if you're like you're Arab. You're going to get 20 questions. They're like, racial profiling? Exactly. <laughs> like, that's exactly the point. Like, yes, we are unabashedly, mm -hmm. yes. Like, oh, okay, so are you Muslim? Like, they ask, are you Muslim? Oh, are you here? Oh, are you practicing Muslim? You know, like, looking in your eyes like poker players. Like, oh, okay, and why are you here? Oh, okay. Wh where, what hotel? Stayed at that hotel before? Why'd you pick that hotel? How much are you paying per room? Like, it's like seriously, and it works, you know, and they have no choice but to do that kind of stuff. Let's do a last story. Okay, Udacity raises $15 million from Andreessen Horowitz, CRV, and Steve Blank. Total funding now, twenty-one, just over $21 million, focuses on short videos, tasks, and quizzes, really uh, involving the students. Founder Sebastian Thrun is a former Google VP and Stanford professor. Twist 271, Twist 271 for Sebastian, great interview. Yep, uh, he hopes to level the playing field between the first world and third world by bringing Stanford-level courses to anyone with an internet connection for free. Question is, will people continue to pay for conventional education to gain the prestige of Stanford and Harvard if this becomes successful? Peter, uh, I'm actually I go to Marshall for that one. Marshall, what's your take? There's Sebastian who was on Twist uh, 271. He was a great interview. He's the guy who made um, Google Goggles and... Uh, Look at how much weight I've lost, too, by the way. I just want to yeah. point that out. I was 212, 211 in that. I'm 188 right now. Marshall, what do you think of my weight loss, and what do you think about um, Udacity? I think that your weight loss is an inspiration. Thank you. I, I commend you on it. I think your 300th show is a great time to celebrate it. Yeah. Uh, I, I also think that uh, Sebastian Thrun, uh, apparently, he, I didn't know he worked on the Google Goggles. He also led the development of the Google self-driving car. Correct. Uh, which is, is nuts. So... Uh, I, I think it, it's notable that uh, that that this company uh, and a couple of others are already getting um, uh, support for offline credits at universities, Colorado State University, as well as some universities in uh, Austria and Germany accept Udacity uh, credits now towards graduation. And apparently they've got a, a deal in place with Pearson to do in-person test proctoring. So I, that's the to, big one. That's the big one. Yeah, so I think that's where it's. I don't think that this online education will likely ever substitute for uh, offline education, but it's where the online really augments and disrupts what used to be in an entirely offline industry. Uh, you know, be that uh, Airbnb or Uber or Yelp or Foursquare. Um, it's that mixed reality stuff that uh, 
that packs the biggest punch. And also edX got funded, I think, with $100 million, a joint venture of Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, and the University of Texas system. And they're going to go after Udacity. And of course, the third one is Coursera. But it really, uh, as Marshall points out, paying for paper is the concept you're going to hear. Paying for paper, what that means is you can take a Udacity course for free. Tens of thousands of people are signing up for these courses. Machine learning, it's the same exact course being taught at Stanford. And it's actually better because you get more motivated students, it turns out, as opposed to people who just have to be at Stanford until they get their degree, from what I understand. He, ha he told me on the, on the uh, show that he had like two or 300 people graduate the class online with higher scores than the highest people, the highest like three or four people in Stanford in person. So 100x the number of people with the highest rating because of this, they're going to be able to go to a specific um, training center where an exam will be given to them. So you just say, I'll be there at 1 o'clock. You go. There's a proctor in there who hands you the paper. They don't even know what's in it. They just watch to make sure you're not cheating. You take the test. You hand it in. You pay 100 I think he said 100 or $200. And you get certified. Holy cow, how much of a game changer is this, Peter? If you had somebody from Udacity who took machine learning and, and, and took artificial intelligence and had the certificate, would you think it's any different than going in person? And would you hire the person or not based upon they took it on Udacity or in person? You know, um, I don't even think we look at resumes to be honest, like or where people went to school when we hire a gadget. I mean, I don't really think a lot about that. I, I, what I do you think about? I think about skill set and I think about motivations and I think about, you know, the where they can fit in and contribute to the culture of the organization and, and uh, you know, whether they can they can do the job and frankly can do the job without being micromanaged, which is like a key thing for me. Um, I, I don't believe in, in micromanaging people at all. Um, you know, and I know that's that's actually something I learned, you know, from you. Yeah. Uh, from you hire great people, you don't have to manage them. So yeah. Peter, and, if I uh, could Good. If I could phrase it a little bit differently, if you had a choice between going to uh, Udacity and going to Harvard again, uh, which would you do? Well, you know, I would probably go back to Harvard, to be honest, because I think for what I, I'm for what I got out of it, I, it wasn't just about the things that I learned. It was about the time to be able to, you know, um, be creative and to and to grow as you know to grow and to meet people and to um, and to frankly figure out what it was I wanted to do with my life which I know that's sort of a, a trite thing, but that's what's great about liberal arts education. Well, what about I mean, for the graduate degree then? Uh, well, I have a master's in English. Okay, uh, what about your you next know. graduate degree? I, mean, I'm, I don't intend to ever go back to school, but... Um, if you, you know, did, if that, you wanted to get your master's if I wanted, in business. If I, wanted to learn, if I wanted to learn how to program or something like that, like I would definitely uh, you know, take an online course like that because I think that it's you know, something where the, the job that you need to do is very credentials-based, Yeah. I think, and very technical in nature. I think that the online learning would probably be as good or better. I think that for a lot of other things, um, it's not just about the, the, the nuts and bolts of what you learn. I think it's also about the, the, the way that in which you learn it and the relationships that you develop and about yeah. you know, the interaction that you have with Marshall, them. you answer the question, we, 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 both on hiring and what you would prefer. I'm concerned that there's a lot of the soft skills and the networking and the human connection and the self-awareness and the, the maturation and growth that happens through offline education that, that could be supplemented really nicely through, through digital stuff. But you show me somebody that's replaced all of that with, uh, with a purely online education, and I would worry that they would be uh, good at, at nothing but following orders. Yeah, so you do have a concern. It's, you do need to think people, so in terms of replacing college. But what about continuing education? I'm working in the workforce. I'm a 32-year-old you know, person at X startup, but I don't know anything about machine learning. I take five courses in machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever, and you see they've got them from Udacity and they've, got, they've been certified. Is that like, oh, I might hire this person based on that? Oh, for sure, yeah. I, might, I mean, there's such a shortage of, of uh, to speak in the crassest of terms, human capital. Uh, in this industry, that uh, anything that that helped people get a get another leg up would would uh, would be of interest to me as an employer. I have to say, for me, I um, I think that this is going to be massively transformative, and I think we're going to see a next the next phase of this is actually going to be that 
uh, people are going to create study groups locally. And the same way, like, uh, you know, TEDx became like the local versions of sure. TED conferences, like, oh, I can't afford the $17 million to attend TED in person or whatever the frack they charge yeah. now. Um, I'm just going to do like my little watching group or I'm going to do my own little event. I think that's what's going to happen here is that 25 people, and it could, you know, could basically create their own little school. Mm. And so let's say 25 inner city kids graduate from high school or they're just overachievers and they say, you know what, we're graduating from high school. What are we going to do? We can't afford to get into college. Let's just get a room somewhere and take these online courses and challenge each other and discuss them. And let's just go faster than everybody else. And like, it's almost like creating your own, uh, you know, like there's like an unconference. It would be an uncollege. You know what I'm saying? I'm just thinking out loud here, but imagine having an uncollege. Jason, I just graduated, Little Bird graduated from an incubator with a program a lot like that called Uh CodeScouts.org that has an emphasis on helping women form offline study groups that work together uh, through online curricula. How was that program? Good program? Uh, oh, it was awesome. The the uh, well, the the pie incubator experiment uh, that we both Little Bird and Code Scouts graduated from uh, worked out really, really well for us. Let me ask you about Portland because I've been watching Portlandia. It's pretty funny. Is it actually as smug and absurd as the show, Portland? Uh, it's hard to estimate what percentage you know it's uh, it's dialed up on that show, but the the jokes strike pretty close to home. Yeah. Uh, I uh, a lot of people own chickens and know where their chicken came from. We uh, actually, if you've seen the Portlandia episode where people are getting lost in that building in the in the creative agency and everybody's being absurd, and then they sit in this weird nest that takes off out through the roof. Yeah. that's where uh, Little Bird and Code Scouts uh, graduated from. I, I just love. If you haven't seen Port, have you seen Portlandia? I haven't. Peter, have you seen Portlandia? Yeah, I've watched it. Yeah. Oh God, it's so genius. Mm-hmm. We were at Lake Tahoe and. We might have had a couple of beverages, and we were watching it, and like literally on like somebody's Netflix account. Like we, we were up till three in the morning watching. We watched it for three hours straight, just laughing our asses mm. off. It's just absolutely hysterical. If you if you open a bottle of wine, you do that. Hey, do one last story. We'll let Peter go. I know he's got a hard stop. But I got to make one go. token hipster comment related to Portlandia. Yes, token hipster yeah. comment. Carrie, you know the other the Carrie and uh, Fred are the the people from yeah. it. I saw Carrie's band in 1994. Wow. Seventeen. Awesome. Free Slater Kinney. That that's pretty legit. Hey, do this one with the startup uh, with the <laughs> wait, rate your waiter. What's that about? Uh, number nine here. Startups. Uh, a startup named Service Stars creates a Yelp for servers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a promo clip. Are you? Oh yeah, I'll play that. Hold on, a second. let me find it. Keep going. Uh, so allows you to identify best service staff. Others, you other users can rate your reviews, and you earn perks. The server's profile goes with them if they change restaurants, acts like a digital resume. Server's prof- server profiles promote both themselves and the employing, the employing establishment. Question, could this work? Would people take the time in this, or is this too niche of a product? Interesting. So I basically rate my waiter. Correct. It's a waiter rater. Waiter. <laughs> it's a waiter rater. Okay. If I was evaluating this like on an angel investing, my first thing would be... You've been pitched to this idea before. I, I have been pitched to this idea before. This is what I'll say. There are times in, in my most manic times, being a foodie, I would absolutely love to rate a waiter. Mostly for good. However, this is taking niche you know, and, and value proposition to such a, a thin layer that... I, I don't even see Yelp or Zagat being able to pull this off, but if Zagat did like a yearly roundup of the you know, 50 best servers in New York and Los Angeles to you know, have like a recognition thing, that might be interesting. But I also thought like food spotting and some of these other places, it just got a little ridiculous. Like it was just too narrow of a, a service mm. to be big. What, what do you think, Peter? You want to rate your waiter? I mean, do waiters even stick around long enough for it to be meaningful data for the average person? Great I mean, point. I mean, it's it's. I mean, if, honestly, if you want to say something, do something nice for your waiter, just tip them more. Fair point, Marshall. <laughs> uh, uh, is this a uh, real company I'm showing you, or did we make this up to fool you? 
Oh, funny. That would be fun. Uh, give me a, a mobile app where I can just read the worst Yelp reviews in town for fun, and I would uh, I'd get more value out of that probably. What, what do you think? This is kind of related to what you do at Squeal, right? I mean, Squeal, you... It's actually it's, very related to Tello. It was, this was Tello, exactly, which Joe Benedito was on the program, and he yeah, pulled pitched, the plug he, on he it. He pitched you exactly this idea initially. Um, and that, yeah, from what I understand, they've kind of it didn't shifted. work. Yeah, but it does work. But to yeah, ask for customer service like you do on Squeal yeah. or other services. And he had quite a bit of money. And uh, why don't you to, take Tello off his hands and merge it with Squeal? Because when when you ask restaurant owners how they feel about it. They're not crazy about it. Oh, I see. But it, but your service does but let people so give is, feedback to the manager. So this is the question. Is is it Who's this really intended for? Is this intended to help the restaurant, or is this intended to help the customer? Or the waiter. It kind of who, feels like the waiter is the one right. who wants to get like a lot of stars and right. get rewarded. But those are two very, those are two very different products. Now, listen, whoever the entrepreneur is, um, I wish them incredible well, but go a little bigger. It's uh, great. Hey, listen, thank you to, uh, and we were going to show a clip from Bravo's, uh, startups of Silicon Valley, um, and uh, here it is. This is uh, a terrible show on Bravo that, I, well, I'm assuming it's terrible, but um, they felt Dave McClure was inappropriate, which I don't think that any of us disagree. Dave McClure is highly inappropriate. That's think, why we love think, him. I don't think he disagrees. I don't think he disagrees, <laughs> but he basically, this is, it's a pretty funny clip. It I have is. to, I have to give the show credit for catching a good Dave McClure moment, but they essentially show Dave like this Bravo with their terrible uh, thing. And I don't know who these kids are who are pitching him, but they felt it was disrespectful that he wanted to run through their pitch deck at his own pace, which I understand. I've had people who are going through the pitch deck, and the entrepreneur says, do you want me to go through the pitch deck? And I say, no. Just tell me what your idea is and tell me how it's going and how it's going to be a billion-dollar business. Just tell me that. And so this is the video of... Hermione Way and Ben, I guess they're brothers and sisters. I think I've met these folks before. And he's just like, I am. Ultimately, if we're going to get this investment, I've got to know what I'm good at, and I'm good at pitching. Okay, That'd so do you mind so, if I take a look through this really quickly, man, no, and then I'll come back and let you go? Got it. Got it, got it. Okay. Dave going through our pitch set like that was really annoying. The whole point of having a pitch deck is you can go through and talk about points and discuss the idea. And I found it slightly disrespectful, him just going through the whole thing and making his own judgment. <laughs> wow. Anyway, whatever. What do you guys think? You going to watch this garbage? I don't have cable. Yeah. Marshall? It's precisely for this reason. To <laughs> make sure you don't accidentally watch this. <laughs> Marshall, uh... Exactly After how I... disrespectful uh, was Dave McClure when you pitched him and you uh, unsuccessfully tried to get his money? Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, he was not disrespectful. He was uh, minimally interested, but made lots of really good introductions to uh, to mentors, which was great. So there you go. I mean, I think this is the thing about this is why with the reality TV stuff, I haven't gotten involved. Nine offers. You've been with me for a number mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's I, I said I wouldn't do it unless I had control. And I just signed a deal with a very famous reality company, as I announced on the program. I think there's a 2 to 5% chance that the show gets made, but it would be with a cable network right. like Bravo. And it's obviously centered around me as an angel investor. You know, let's just say Gordon Ramsay, Shark Tankish. Yeah. And we're going to start pitching it. To, or they're already started. They got three or four people who are interested. That's why they wanted to sign me. I signed. And maybe, you know, and I told them I'll do it. And I insisted that I have final say on the editorial. And they finally agreed. And I was like, oh, they agree. Okay, fine, let's go. I got final edit. But I would never let them make me into a monkey. Like, these poor people look like such dopes. To, but these aren't the best entrepreneurs anyway. They're just dopey people. And to, well, to there, was, there Dave, are a couple of them that are... Dave. Their correspondents, you know, Hermione Way and, uh, and Sarah Austin are both, they've done a lot of, of intriguing work outside of this that they deserve respect for, too. I like yeah. Sarah. Yeah, I know her work. But they make them look so dopey, don't they? I mean, I, I think yeah. the idea was there. They I, I don't think Dave comes off disrespectful at all, and that's just Dave. I mean, no, they, of course, a, Dave's a no BS kind of guy. Right. He, he uses seven curse words per sentence, and he's going to tell you the straight dope. He's going to be like, "This is stupid. This but is he sees, brilliant." He sees so many things and can vet an idea yeah. so fast 
you're far better off letting him just read your deck. Of course, of course. Who is this? Who's Ben Way? Who is that guy? I don't even know who he is. Anyway, whatever. He's probably good at He's a good-looking guy, so I give him credit for that. He's a pretty handsome guy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Peter Rojas. Everybody, uh, follow at Peter Rojas uh, on his Twitter account and check out gdgt.com. Uh, before you purchase an item, figure out what you should buy, figure out the score, and if after you buy it, figure out how to use it, and if you have any questions, you'll get them answered instantly. Everybody, uh, follow Marshall K on Twitter and check out Get Little Bird. Sign up, and Marshall, please get me a beta account, please, under NDA we'll for do. NDA. Yep. I actually signed tomorrow, up yesterday or two days ago. Thanks. Awesome. We'll get you one tomorrow. Thank you, pal. And uh, listen, hey, thank you at Snap Terms. Welcome to the family. Everybody check out at Snap Terms and say thank you at Snap Terms on your Twitter account. If you made it to one hour and 15 minutes into the program, it is your geary, it is your duty, it is your humble honor to support the program by thanking the sponsors on your social media accounts. And, of course, and uh, go check out, I use the pro, coma, promo code TWIST on Snap Terms and MailChimp. You know I love you guys. You know that you can do no wrong in my eyes and that you make a beautiful uh, product that is designed with emotion and consistency and awesome features. The free plan's always free. I love you guys at MailChimp for making a great product that makes my life so easy. We'll s oh, and hey, um, thanks to, uh, hey, 300th episode, so thanks to everybody who's worked on the program over the years. Mark Jeffrey, Carolyn, who else has worked on the program? On and on. Don Al Harris, of yeah. course. Alex Miller Alex back in the day. Alex Miller. I mean, just so many people have done so much work into yeah. here. And Tyler, thanks for bringing the cake for the 300. Of course, yeah. I told them no cakes. Let's <laughs> just have a plain show. But uh, hey, thanks, Tyler, for also. It's been of course. A, you know, it's one of the best parts of this has been, you know, of hanging course. out with you over the years and having fun doing the program. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>